Um, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to session seven of the Sea Power Conference, uh, where we'll be looking at commonality of purpose from the perspective of Australia's four oceans. My name is Simon Sykes. I'll be a master of ceremonies for today. Uh, before we commence the proceedings this morning, I'd like to go through a couple uh, of housekeeping items. Uh, for those of you in the theatre, um, please make sure all your electronic devices are turned to silent mode. Um, there is no need to turn them off. Uh, indeed, I encourage all of you to, uh, to leave a one device on with the uh, Indo-Pacific 2002 app on it, um, which will be used to submit questions. Um, please try to make use of it well. Um, I also encourage the, uh, the people that are joining us via the video stream to use the app as well um, to submit questions to the panel. Um, in the event that there is something disastrous happened today, in the event of emergency, uh, we'll be alerted by an alarm. I haven't heard it yet, which is good. Um, if this happens, please leave the theatre in an orderly manner um, by the emergency exits, which are at the four corners of the theatre that we're in, uh, and then follow the directions of the theatre staff. Um, the members of our panel this morning are uh, uh, Rear Admiral Chris Smith, uh, Admiral Julio Lieva Molina, uh, Dr David Brewster, uh, Dr Anthony Bergen and uh, Dr, Dr Beck Strating. Um, unfortunately, we've lost one of the expert panel members who was to discuss the Southern Ocean um, this morning, uh, but Dr Strating has offered to present Dr Buchanan's paper uh, on her behalf. The panel is being chaired this morning uh, by Rear Admiral Chris Smith. Rear Admiral Smith joined the Australian Navy in 1989. Uh, he has conducted numerous operational deployments and commanded the patrol boat uh, Gladstone, the frigate HMS Darwin and the LHD HMS Canberra. More recently, Rear Admiral Smith served as the Commander Surface Force and the Director General Littoral before assuming his current role as the Deputy Chief of Navy. Uh, Sir, so I invite you to take the floor. Excuse me, and address this morning's session. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, <clears throat> and pay my respects uh, to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Welcome to session seven, the maritime domain of the Indian in Indo-Pacific, Australia's four oceans, an island nation. Australia's four oceans are profound. The Western Ocean is an anarchical domain with no overarching security infrastructure. The Eastern Ocean haunts Australian strategic inquiry and the Southern Ocean is undermined with scientific optimism. The Northern Ocean is a wonderland of resources coveted by many nations and an environment that reveals tactical challenges with strategic implications, which play out daily in this maritime domain. The four oceans that surround Australia are connected physically, but they are distinct and shaped by their history and geopolitics. Additionally, the different strategic ideas that emanate from within these separate oceans indicate that one singular strategic narrative will not address the challenges or the implications that feature within each of these maritime domains. This session will explore, examine, and evaluate Australia's four oceans and reveal that a specific frequency is required to address the defining geopolitics, ambitions, challenges, and desires for each region. Ladies and gentlemen, the keynote speaker today is Admiral Julio Leva Molina. Admiral Molina was Commander in Chief for the Chilean Navy from 2017 until 2021. Prior to this, he held positions as Director of Personnel Chief of Naval Operations, Head of National Defence and Commander of the First Naval Zone. He started his career as a midshipman before graduating as an electrical engineer in 1985 and attending the staff course at the Chilean Naval War College. Admiral Sir, I invite you to present your keynote address. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Two big challenges for me. First of all, being here in front of you, and the second one, to speak in English, having in mind that, that in my country we speak Spanish. My apologies if I made any, any mistake. Let me tell you that you are right if you are asking yourself what that retired Chilean Navy Admiral is doing in this part of the world 
speaking in this conference. Please allow me to take some minutes of your time, and I will do my best to answer that important question. From the other shore of the Indo-Pacific, the Chilean perspective, the map shows how far apart Australia and Chile are. 11,000 kilometers separate Sydney from Valparaiso. But the good news is our countries will be soon be physically connected. How, you may ask? By something like this? Yes, why not? But along the seafloor. A fiber optic submarine cable will put us in touch quickly and safely so that Chile will have a gateway to the heart of the Indo-Pacific and Australia to South America. Beside the inherent feat of laying this long cable, it is a remarkable example of the fact that when there is determination, any dis distance can be overcome. As history shows, maritime nations seek each other, and when they come together, they achieve great things. First, I would like to thank you for this invitation for the most important sea power conference in the Indo-Pacific and the opportunity to address this distinguished audience on behalf of Athena Lab, a new, vigorous Chilean think tank dedicated to security, defense, and international relations. Well now by my great friend, Vice Admiral Mike Noonan, who entrusted me with the mission of sharing with you my country's vision towards the Indo-Pacific and Antarctica. What do we have in common with Australia? First, there are some interesting similarities between Chile and Australia. Both are located in the southern hemisphere at similar latitudes and have similar populations. Australia and Chile have the third and the tenth largest exclusive economic zones in the world, with 58 and 27 million square kilometers respectively. Also, Australia has the largest maritime search and rescue area in the world, followed by New Zealand and then Chile. Meanwhile, Chile is, for all intents and purposes, an island. A large part of the territory is located in South America, but surrounded by sea, mountains, the driest desert in the world to the north, and ice to the south. Australia is an island nation, but continental in size. So its maritime challenges are greater than any country in the world. But Chile is tricontinental. We're also in the Antarctica and Oceania, which present its own significant challenges. 95% of Chile's international trade moves by sea, and Australia is even higher. Both have economies based on exporting commodities, iron, copper, meat, salmon. And along with our friends, from New Zealand, claim to produce the best wine in the southern hemisphere. We depend heavily on foreign oil and share the same trading partners, China, Japan, South Korea, and the US. Our governments are seeking to diversify our export destination, reducing our strategic commercial dependence in our main trading partner, China. Recently, our navies have achieved great rapprochement and interoperability following the acquisition of two magnific magnificent Adelaide class frigates, which have joined our fleet with surprising ease. We feel that we are like minded navies, brothers and sisters in our region waters. We hope that you feel the same. Finally, both nations signed the Antarctic Treaty and claim territories on that continent. Fortunately, not the same ones, so our friendship is not at risk. On the contrary, we can join forces to maintain the Antarctic governance in the face of a possible threat by revisionist powers. Naturally, one difference is that Australia's level of development far exceeds that of Chile, both in total GDP and per capita income. And another is that we cannot compete with your wonderful beaches in this country. In summary, many things you need us. We depend on the sea to survive. Our products move throughout the Pacific and our navies have a close relation. 
and we claim sovereignty in the Antarctic territories. What should Chile look towards the sea? Chile has chosen the Pacific as a platform to come out its confinement and connect with the world. Through the sea, we reduce the distance from the sense of power and broaden our economy to achieve the prosperity our people yearn for. The sea presents opportunities, but there are also risks. Russia's military aggression against Ukraine showed that the war between states is a real possibility, and it manifests itself harshly at sea. Sailors must understand that their priority role is to win the war at sea, either by themselves or in coalitions. Win or die is the motto of our Navy. This war also demonstrated that the stability of maritime theaters is crucial to rule-based international order. We know Chile has a responsibility to contribute to the stability in the Indo-Pacific. That's the reason we are here. Do not, we do not believe in free riders. How do we contribute? Generate the deterrence from sea against potential threats to our territorial sovereignty and population. So thanks for the frigate. Participating as a country with allies in the protection of maritime trade in ocean that affects Chile development and prosperity. Protecting our ocean of interest from pollution, illegal and indiscriminate fishing, drug trafficking, irregular immigration and other crimes contemplated by the UN clause. Providing logistical support for national and international scientific activities in the Antarctic territory claimed by Chile. Maintaining the sea as a secure connection between Chile and the rest of the world. How can Chile use the ocean for its purposes? Maritime countries need for freely use of the ocean, for which they must to be able to protect themselves at sea from a possible aggression by a foreign power. The ocean provides defense in depth against an attack by a foreign power on the continental and insular territory with intent of damaging or invading. The most important thing for a nation is to preserve its integrity and sovereignty. Therefore, it needs a navy and armed forces that can deter and or defeat possible aggressors. Protecting maritime trade. Countries cannot escape their geographical reality. And the truth is that the Chile is far from the export destinations. Therefore, in order to remain competitive, it is essential that already long sea line of communications remain free and uninterrupted. Chile's prosperity relies on the fact that 95% of foreign trade is carried out by sea. We believe that the UN clause compliance is a guarantee for all nations can exercise and all nations can exercise that right. Any country that threatens freedom of navigation threatens everyone. Some events are undoubtedly looming over this freedom in the Indo-Pacific. In the Indian Ocean, attacks on oil tankers in the Strait of Hormuz and the vulnerability of commercial shipping in the Swiss Canal call for closer examination. In the South China Sea, China's construction of artificial island has elicited complaints from the coastal countries, but the construction continues, causing tensions with those who navigate these routes. Little known by many, Chile sent a frigate to the Philippine Sea in 2020, during the worst time of the COVID outbreak, to operate with a task group led by the US Navy. Another frigate will soon join RIMPAC Naval Exercise, where we have assumed important executive positions. A Chilean Navy Commodore served in 2018 as Combined Force Maritime Component Commander of RIMPAC, making Chile the first non-founding a non-speaking English country to assume such responsibility. Ensuring sustainable development. Chile is the 12th fishing power in the world. We aim to fish sustainably, which is why about 43% of our EEZ are protected areas. A signature of the New York Agreement, and as a country affected by depredation of the sea, our Navy supervise and control marine areas they, that may be threatened, constantly monitoring foreign fleets, mostly Chinese, that position themselves in the South Pacific. Fighting crime on the high seas. 
keeping the seas free of criminal activities such as drug trafficking, whose epicenters, including Latin America, contributes to global security because they are transnational phenomena. In other words, we take care of coasts and ports to prevent drugs from crossing the Indo-Pacific. Ensuring the Antarctic future. South of the Indo-Pacific is the Antarctica, which perhaps should receive more attention in many countries' strategies towards the micro region, considering that your political competition has increased strongly for what is called the continent of the future. The number of bases has increased, has increased exponentially in the last three decades, and even, for example, for example, Turkey, a country without projection in the area, has a polar program in full development. As long as the Antarctica Treaty remains in force, all claims remain frozen, including those of Australia and Chile. But we know that the international order is in jeopardy due to those who do not respect the rules and prioritize the use of force. We believe that we must support the treaty, continue to facilitate scientific activity, and protect the environment. In a couple of years, the 10,000 tons icebreaker we are building will be ready to fulfill those missions. What Chile should do to fulfill its task in the ocean? Have a navy capable of breathing in seas of national interest. Chile has historically maintained a sea power and for the fulfillment of a wide spectrum of tasks. The Chilean Navy is a medium-sized, blue water navy and fulfills the military role and the policing role using its means as in an integrated manner. It has 25,000 men and women. For them, it's a lifelong career. It operates bases, stations, and garrisons throughout continental Chile, the Chilean Antarctic, and Easter Island or Rapa Nui. It operates surface fleet, submarines, naval aviation, Marine Corps, transport command, and special forces. Today, the Navy is carrying out an ambitious naval shipbuilding plan, which allows it to maintain its presence in, in this area that is already large to protect. Two multi-purpose tra transport ships will be soon begin construction to later start building our own frigate in our own shipyards, just as you did. I have to admit that the Chilean Navy took some good, very good ideas from your Navy to promote the naval shipbuilding plan between our people. Chile has had peace for 143 years, although in 1978 a crisis, a crisis brought us to bring a war with Argentina. This is not free. We work every day to maintain peace at home, while at the same time doing everything possible to export security. Integrate cooperative alliance to protect common interests with allies in the oceans. To protect Chile's interest in the world's ocean, it is necessary for, to form coalition with allied countries. These alliances begin by sharing common interests and values to then generate naval cooperation and joint exercise, and finally, develop cooperative deployment with other navies in place of interest. Recently, Australian sailors provided training in Chile waters to operate the two other light class frigates we acquired. The ability of a navy to quickly integrate into coalition is an asset, and we are able to do so thanks to the fact that we operate in English, and with NATO standard operational procedures. Finally, considering current events, today more than ever, countries that share principles, values, and interests must work together, because more can be achieved through cooperation than individually. For Chile, Australia is a success story. Friendship and familiarity have led us to form an unprecedented rapprochement which is already producing many mutual benefits in a free and open Pacific. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral. It's, uh, you, you've highlighted to us that oceans don't separate us, they connect us in so many ways. And uh, 
uh, the way that you've shared both the challenges and the opportunities that we both face together has really set us for this morning's discussion well. So thank you for your comments. Next, we'll move to a focus on the Indian Ocean. Uh, and uh, I'll be inviting Dr David Brewster to come and speak. Uh, David is a senior research fellow with the National Security College at the Australian National University, where he works on Indian Ocean and Indo-Pacific maritime security. Dr Brewster is also a distinguished research fellow with the Australian India Institute, University of Melbourne, and is a frequent speaker at international security conferences throughout the region. David. Thank you, Admiral. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, this morning. So um, I've been asked to talk about the Indian Ocean, the great ocean to the west of our continent. Um, and the starting point in any discussion about our, uh, Australia's approach to the Indian Ocean is really one of neglect. Historically, Australia has largely neglected a uh, strong security role in the Indian Ocean and our relationships in the region. And rather, historically, the focus, the key focus uh, of Australia, both in terms of opportunities and threats, has been on the Pacific. Now, this is all changing as uh, uh, part of our Indo-Pacific strategy of our, uh, because of our development of key new relationships in the region, including with countries like India, but also because of the changing strategic dynamics in the Indian Ocean. And this involves both threats and opportunities. And I'll start with the threats bit and I'll, I'll end up with some of the opportunities. So I'll be talking about how these uh, strategic, uh, these changing dynamics uh, stem from major powers, uh, middle powers and the smaller powers. And the key takeaway is that after decades of US dominance in the Indian Ocean, it's now becoming a much more complex, congested and contested strategic space. It's driven by, principally driven by major power competition, uh, but it presents both uh, opportunities and challenges for everyone in the region. And in particular, smaller countries will find it very difficult to escape uh, the impact of this strategic competition. So, so let's start with the major powers. The United States has been the predominant power in the Indian Ocean for more than four decades, and it's likely to remain the strongest power for many years to come, even as it's relatively diminishes. But there are a lot of uncertainties about the US role in the region. Washington's strategic focus on the Indian Ocean has always been centered on its interests in the, in the Persian Gulf. It has other importance in the Indian Ocean, including upholding the free flow of commerce and international norms, etc. But its key focus has been on the, on the Persian Gulf. But in an era of major power competition with both China and Russia, the Indian Ocean is ultimately a secondary uh, area of priority of Was for Washington compared with the Pacific. Overall, Washington's preference will be to prevent the Indian Ocean becoming a priority theatre which makes uh, greater demands on US defence resources. But uh, how these considerations could affect the balance of power in the region may defend, depend on uh, factors that are both within and not within Washington's control. So changes in US dependence on oil from the Persian Gulf uh, may be an important factor on, on Washington's role in the region. The US is far, now far less dependent on energy from the Persian Gulf than it has been for many decades. And this may fundamentally alter US defence commitment to the Indian Ocean. Future US administrations may not always feel compelled to protect energy being exported to China and other countries. A second major change in regional dynamics 
comes from the emergence of India as the largest economy and the biggest military power among Indian Ocean littoral states. India has long harboured ambitions to be recognised as the leading Indian Ocean power with special security responsibilities in the region. Its concerns are now very much directed at China, meaning that strategic competition between China and India is likely to become an increasingly important, perhaps probably the most important uh, factor in the dynamics of the region. And one of the biggest challenges or changes in India's strategic posture in recent years has been its willingness to enter into new alignments with the United States and other partners such as Australia, France and Japan in order to leverage its position vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. Another big change in the region comes from China's growing presence. Uh, Beijing has important strategic interests in the Indian Ocean which are likely to uh, drive an ever greater military presence in coming years. It's widely understood that China's most crucial interest in, is the protection of its trading routes in the Indian Ocean, over which a large majority of its oil, uh, imported oil needs are transported. But China has also has other important strategic interests in the region, including a growing number of Chinese nationals and investments. China's flagship initiative in the region, the BRI, involves building new pathways across the Indian Ocean, both on land and at sea. New ports could potentially facilitate a large and sustained presence of the Chinese Navy, and perhaps just as significant are new overland pathways being built from southern China through Pakistan and through Myanmar uh, towards to the Indian Ocean, which could effectively make China a resident power of the Indian Ocean. Uh, these developments will almost inevitably entrench China's power in the region. Now, there's a significant chance that China's people and investments may need Chinese military protection from potential threats if local security forces are not sufficient. China has already deployed a detachment of Marines to its new base in Djibouti to protect China's Chinese nationals and investments in Africa, and we should expect further developments elsewhere in the region in coming years. The adverse financial consequences of the BRI for some Indian Ocean states are always also becoming apparent. China is coming under increasing criticism for so-called debt trap diplomacy with economically vulnerable countries. Pakistan is already seeing unsustainable indebtedness incurred in some projects, and Sri Lanka is now experiencing the consequences of entering into a number of uh, financially unfeasible BRI projects. So how are these big powers competing in the, in, in the Indian Ocean? In the Pacific, the United States and China are the main strategic competitors, but the dynamics are somewhat different in the Indian Ocean, where competition is at its sharpest between China and India. Delhi sees China's growing presence in the Indian Ocean is fundamentally uh, challenging its ambitions to be recognised as the leading power in the region. And China's relationships in the region are perceived as being directed against India to encircle it or to keep it off balance. Uh, for its part, Beijing pays little heed to Indian sensitivities. So strategic competition between India and China is, will increasingly involve jostling for, between the two countries for political influence in smaller countries. And sometimes this has been a factor in domestic political upheavals. And we're going to see this uh, almost certainly increase in coming years. Now, this changing balance has been complemented by the growing role of middle powers in the region. 
These include established middle powers such as Australia and France, as well as emerging economies such as Indonesia and Bangladesh even. And in coming years, they may be joined by large and fast growing East African countries, potentially including countries such as Ethiopia, Kenya and Tanzania. It's a long way off, but uh, the growth of the economies of these countries could well propel them into middle power league. Uh, so active, Australia has long been an active middle power in the region. France has, had a, has long had a large military presence in the region and now approaches the Indian Ocean as part of a broader Indian Ocean strategy. Through the 20th century, Indonesia largely turned its back on the Indian Ocean, giving much of its attention to Southeast Asia. But Indonesia may increasingly come to understand the extent of its potential influence in the Indian Ocean, particularly in soft power and its ability to bring diverse partners together. Other extra regional middle powers are becoming increasingly active in the Indian Ocean. Japan, for example, uh, is, uh, is building quite a, an influential presence in the region. Russia too is returning to the Indian Ocean after having largely been absent since the end of the Cold War. This includes, includes a growing presence in Africa of both military forces and mercenaries. And Moscow hopes to leverage this military presence to pursue opportunities for arms sales, investments, and to keep the United States off balance. Growing major power competition will place smaller countries, many smaller countries, in a difficult position. Major powers such as China, India and the United States seek to build influence among such countries for economic gain, political benefit or for military purposes. Now this can have a significant adverse impact on the political stability or economic development of smaller powers. In recent years, strategic competition between larger powers have contributed to the destabilisation of several Indian Ocean states. Uh, current events in Sri Lanka can in part be directly traced to its recent dealings with China. But we shouldn't uh, consider small states as mere pawns or objects of strategic competition among major powers and even the smallest island states can have considerable agency. This means that larger and middle powers need to step up their engagement with smaller Indian Ocean countries to assist them on issues that matter to them. And that principally involves issues such as climate change and other transnational security issues. It's no good for countries like Australia to try and engage with these countries on issues that matter to us. We need to speak to them in their language on issues that matter to them. Now, all of these developments point towards the Indian Ocean becoming a much more uh, multipolar and complex strategic environment than at any time in modern history. And middle, power, middle powers such as Australia will play, likely play a much more important role in the regional balance of power than ever before. Now, this is going to involve uh, joining with other countries in coalitions, both with traditional partners and non-traditional partners. And that will require a level of agility and innovation that we probably have not experienced for many decades. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of this talk that it's not just about threats. It's very important that we don't just categorise the Indian Ocean region as an area of threats. Yes, it's an area of instability. Yes, it's an area of potential threats. But so was the Asia-Pacific in the 1970s 
when Australia really stepped up its engagement there. Remember, we had just lost a war in Vietnam and uh, there was every likelihood uh, that civil conflicts and communist-inspired conflicts would expand in the Asia-Pacific. But that triggered a desire on the part of Australia, a very conscious policy of engagement with the region to help stabilise the region and share in the growing prosperity in the region. And I would argue that quite similar dynamics are now at play in the Indian Ocean. Yes, there's areas of instability. Yes, there are areas of concern. But the Indian Ocean in coming years will likely become uh, one of the key areas of economic growth in the world. There's a whole string of countries that are likely to become the new economic tigers of the world. And it's really incumbent on Australia to step forward and engage with these countries in a positive way, both to, try, both to help stabilise the region, but also uh, with a view to sharing in uh, the prosperity of the region in coming years. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, David, for your insights there. The increasing and in, uh, importance and focus on the Indian Ocean as we move forward, uh, and also the dynamics that potentially change both opportunities uh, and threats. Uh, we now move to the, um, uh, the Pacific, uh, where Dr Anthony Bergen is, uh, will join us and speak around this area. Dr Bergen is a senior fellow of the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. His expertise in the maritime security, oceans policy, homeland security, disaster and resilience, South Pacific, Antarctica and climate security. For 20 years, Dr Bergen served as an academic at the Australian Defence Force Academy, has written extensively on a wide range of national security and maritime issues in academic journals, books and ASPE reports. The Pacific Islands, while <clears throat> small, have very enormous ocean areas, 28% 20 <clears throat> of all exclusive economic zones in the world, which makes the Pacific Islands large ocean states. Growing strategic competition in the region means that the island states are becoming the battlegrounds for influence amongst major powers. The pervasive nature of the strategic environment faced by the Pacific Island countries makes virtually all security threats in the region maritime in one way or another. So let me just take you through some of the maritime security threats and challenges. Firstly, <clears throat> the one that's been in the news the most in Australia, that's the Solomon Islands security agreement with China. Now that 2002 framework agreement between China and Solomon Islands on security cooperation that allows China to use its military to, quote, protect the safety of Chinese personnel and major projects, unquote, raises concerns for the broader Pacific Islands region. By specifically noting military personnel, armed forces and ship visits with stopover uh, and transition arrangements, the agreement, in my judgment, is a precursor to a full-blown military base under the pretext of protecting Chinese interests. In many ways, I think it's a direct strategic response by China to Australia's decision to procure SSNs. A base in the Solomons would give China increased options for complicating deployment from, from the foreshadowed Australian East Coast submarine base. In essence, the move would allow China to employ the mix of nuclear and conventional powered submarines beyond the defence of its own waters. Thus, naval <coughs> facilities in the Solomons would allow China to complicate the, the deployment of Australian missile submarines before they get anywhere near the theatre of uh, operations around Taiwan. 
A Chinese naval facility in the Solomons would provide the means to mount the kind of harassment operations with Chinese fishing boats, in quotes, if you like, shepherded by its Coast Guard vessels of the, time, uh, of the type that we've seen China mount in Southeast Asian waters. The requirements for such a strategy would coalesce if China managed to conclude the proposed fisheries agreement with Papua New Guinea. Next, on IEU fishing, illegal, unregulated, unreported fishing. Obviously, it's an enormous challenge. The Pacific's of the, the home for the, the largest uh, tuna uh, resource in the world. IEU fishing in the Pacific is dominated by licensed vessels not complying with the rules, not so much rogue vessels, not the I part of the illegal, unreported and unregulated, but rather the unreported, the U. Estimated costs of IU fishing within the Central Western Pacific, um, the, the best estimate at the moment, $333 million a year. Climate change and sea level rise. Climate change puts pressure on the marine environment. Um, climate change enhanced storms, rising sea levels, coastal flooding are disproportionately affecting many island nations. Rising sea levels threaten to reduce the extent of the island's maritime uh, zones as coastlines retreat or offshore features like islands, rocks and reef used as part of the baseline are uh, eroded or submerged. Now, we have seen China's island, um, the magic island making boats that have been operating in the South China Sea. They're now looking for new places to dredge. And it does, to me, look like there's an opening for China to extend their helping hand uh, to the Pacific where they're demonstrated island making capabilities. Trans transnational crime is a big issue for the islands. Much of the transnational crime reported in the Pacific is of a maritime uh, uh, dimension. Apart from IEU fishing, other forms include illegal logging, illegal trade in wildlife, drugs and small arms. Human trafficking, illegal migration occurs across the Pacific. Most of the traffickers are Chinese nationals using states like Palau and Fiji as transit points for other destinations in the region. Piracy in the Pacific, not so much. Um, I'd talk, prefer to characterise it as sea robbery rather than piracy because most of the attacks are occurring in coastal areas around uh, particularly Papua New Guinea. Um, so they're in territorial seas rather than offshore. So they're, they're more sea robbery rather than piracy. Maritime terrorism, uh, generally the threat there is perceived as low, but there, there has been a concern because the cruise industry is massive uh, in the Pacific Islands <clears throat> and cruise liners may be, may be vulnerable to, to bomb attacks on board. Sovereignty is a big issue because most of the Pacific Islands are archipelagic countries, so they've got a, a string of uh, outer islands um, and foreign ve fishing vessels, cruising yachts often make illegal calls to these outer islands. They're involved uh, in activities from uh, illegal landing of drugs, alcohol, uh, tobacco and so forth. The marine environment is incredibly important to these island countries because many of them depend on marine-based tourism for their income. Um, and there are enormous range of maritime uh, environmental threats in the Pacific, um, it's one of the world's um, hotspots, if I can put it like that, for marine plastics. Uh, they, the, the islands only contribute 1.3% of the mismanaged plastics in the world's ocean, <coughs> but they're one of the main recipients. Another issue is, <coughs> uh, environmental issue, is the thousands of Second World War shipwrecks that, that they're ticking time bombs right throughout the Pacific. Um, because the hulls are eroding. Uh, that's a huge issue. Maritime natural hazards uh, like tsunamis and cyclones, always a threat. Shipping, uh, sorry, uh, maritime safety, search and rescue is obviously an enormous issue because these islands do depend on seaborne um, transport for, for, the, for, for the most part, um, inter-island transport. Uh, for moving people and goods. Um, there's been an enormous range of ferry uh, disasters, for example, in the Pacific. 
Um, undersea cables, we saw what happened um, when in the island country of Tonga lost connection um, a few months ago. It, was, it, it had a single cable, a submarine cable for um, its, its comms and, and you know, internet. Um, and it went down. And submarine cable protection is pretty underdeveloped. Uh, we've seen China um, trying to, uh, to offer submarine cable uh, capabilities in the Pacific, and Australia has, <coughs> excuse me, stepped in uh, in a number of cases. So look, next steps. Um, there's the list of horrors, uh, as it were. Um, what are some of the next steps? Um, my judgment is that maritime security threats along the lines that I've just set out are going to increase for the Pacific Island states. So a whole of government approach for these island countries is going to be critical uh, and, and they lack that. <coughs> Very few, almost none of the island's uh, countries have developed a maritime security strategy to meet their own specific uh, ocean needs and circumstances. Significant gaps exist in much of the Pacific in terms of their legal frameworks to deal with the full range of activity at sea. Island agencies in the Pacific rely, in my, uh, when, when I've gone to these countries, they rely on a huge panoply of, of legislation, customs, fisheries, quarantine, immigration, etc., to draw upon their enforcement powers at sea. And that can, and that can sometimes <coughs> excuse me, lead to inefficiencies. The island states maritime patrol vessels have limited range, endurance and seagoing, and that issue is now being currently addressed um, by Australia providing the Guardian class uh, patrol boat. Um, I think one of the challenges that Australia face, though, is to <coughs> effectively implement that maritime security program, because when I've visited the islands and looked at how they're managing their patrol boats, uh, there's an enormous difference, <coughs> excuse me, in the range of their, their skill sets, their maritime workforce, their maritime recruitment, the national pride or lack of it that some of the island countries have in the vessel. So that's going to be a huge issue going forward. Um, <coughs> excuse me, another issue, capability issue, I think, is maritime training, uh, law enforcement training. Um, my ob observation is that most of the fisheries officers from the different island countries are currently trained to enforce regulations against IEU fishing only, and they're not so much familiar with other illegal uh, activity at sea. Air surveillance in remote areas is, is woefully underdone, and where appropriate, I think the island countries should pool, be encouraged to pool their, their aerial surveillance assets. Maritime domain awareness is also uh, undeveloped in the region. <coughs> and I think countries like Australia, uh, US, Japan, should be assisting the island countries to improve their national MDA systems so, uh, so they can then contribute to a regional MDA system. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. Maritime safety, transport, I've already mentioned, is, 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 is a weakness. Um, we should be looking to upgrade navigation systems, ferries, wharves and so forth. Why don't we think about, uh, like we've done successfully with the patrol boats, why don't we think about offering ferries, donating ferries, uh, Australian produced ferries to the Pacific? Finally, um, on training schemes, I think there's scope to build national institutions for maritime training, um, and I might just leave it there. Thank you very much. Anthony, thank you for your insights there uh, on the many challenges in an area of significant and intensifying uh, geopolitical competition while still managing many of the legacy issues that you mentioned. Uh, now we're going to move uh, to the Northern Ocean and, and um, also to the Southern Ocean. Um, uh, Dr. Beck Stratting has, uh, as we heard, uh, Dr. Buchanan can't be with us today due to, to COVID. It continues to impact us and uh, uh, Dr. Stratting has uh, kindly uh, um, stepped up and she'll provide both those perspectives. Uh, Dr. Stratting is a Director of La Trobe Asia and Associate Professor of Politics, Media and Philosophy. Uh, she's current research interests include maritime disputes in the Indo-Pacific and Australian foreign policy. 
In 2019, she was awarded an Asia Studies Visiting Fellowship at the East West Centre in Washington, DC, to conduct a research project titled Defending the Rules of Rules-Based Maritime Order. She's also a visiting affiliate fellow at the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore, an affiliated researcher at Georgetown University, and is currently a non-visiting fellow at the Perth US Asia Centre. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, it's great to be here and I'd like to thank the Sea Power Centre for inviting me back to the conference. Uh, I have been tasked with talking about the Northern Oceans and what, um, I guess we should begin with what does that mean? And I've interpreted that to mean uh, the Northern Seas, so the Torres Strait, Timor Sea, Arafura and Coral Seas. Uh, and conventional Australian defence planning has long been preoccupied uh, with North Australia uh, and our northern approaches. And we heard in the introduction uh, that these northern seas present certain tactical challenges by virtue of their geography. Uh, and there's certainly a range of kind of key strategic issues that, uh, that, that, that relate to uh, North Australia. But I think that there are many people in this room that know more about those issues than what I do. So what I would like to offer is examining the Northern Seas as a way of providing alternatives for thinking about Australia's strategic imagination and how we see our history and our sense of national identity. Uh, we can also look at the Northern Seas in terms of how we relate with re regional states, uh, particularly Indonesia, Timor-Leste and Papua New Guinea. Uh, the Northern Seas also can tell us uh, interesting things about the nature of maritime security challenges. And what I'll be talking about intersects a lot with what Anthony was just talking about in the Pacific. These maritime security challenges are multifaceted, they're complex, they're intersecting, they combine conventional and emerging threats. Uh, and maritime security uh, um, uh, intersects with climate change, with issues of blue economy, with pandemics, uh, with transnational crime in ways that we can see in the Northern Sea. So I'd like to make four points in my presentation. First, the Northern Seas are seeing an increase in IUU fishing that's been quite dramatic over the last couple of years. So according to the Australian Fisheries Management Authority, illegal fishing boats intercepted in Australia's Northern Seas has increased from eight in 20. 2021 period to 231 uh, in 2021 and 2022. So that's quite a significant jump uh, in, uh, in, in the interception of illegal fishing boats. Uh, and this suggests that these seas are home to valuable resources, including uh, trepang or otherwise known as sea cucumber. Now this was an important trading commodity between Australia's various First Nations people uh, and the Macassans from um, the Sulawesi in Indonesia. And even today can fetch 15 to $30 a kilogram at Indonesian markets. So IUU fishing is linked to other security challenges such as the pandemic, environmental conservation and issues of economic development. One of the push factors uh, for this increase uh, in illegal fishing boats in this area is COVID-19 because this has increased poverty uh, in regions across Southeast Asia. And risks of COVID-19 spreading has also shaped the way that Australian vessels can respond to IUU fishing in these areas. For example, by escorting rather than detaining uh, vessels. So that's one push factor. Pandemics can actually have flow on effects into blue crime. A second factor are the disputes and the sustainability issues in the South China Sea, uh, which have reportedly pushed some of these vessels uh, south into Australia's northern waters. So here we have issues of environmental degradation and sustainability that become associated with other blue crimes, such as piracy and modern day slavery. It highlights how security challenges are interconnected and it also highlights how maritime domains are also connected. The second point I'd like to make 
is that Australia's foreign and defence policies could do a lot more to recognise and embrace Indigenous knowledges and heritage, uh, including the universal philosophy that much like the world's oceans, all things are connected. A better understanding of the Northern Sea's uh, pre-colonial international relations might mitigate this sort of ongoing idea that's out there that Australia is sea blind, meaning that the seas don't factor much into how Australia views the nation. Because Australia's First Nations claim a rich history of pre-colonial relations and through trading routes in the Northern Seas. From about the 1700s, there was the beginning of trade links uh, between Aboriginal people of Northern Australia uh, and the Makassar from the Sulawesi. So, Indigenous seafarers, navigators and sailors used sophisticated networks, uh, methods of networks, connections and exchange grounded in environmental consciousness and connection to both the land and the sea. And I'd like to recognise uh, that we are meeting on this harbour which continues to have cultural significance to the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. So on IUU fishing issues, contemporary state-based fishing zones have, and, and fishing interests have collided awkwardly with traditional fishing grounds in the Northern Sea. So Australia and Papua New Guinea share a fishing zone in the Torres Strait that enables local communities to access traditional fishing rights. And there are recent re reports, I think Anthony alluded to it uh, before, recent reports that a Chinese company wants to build an industrial fishing park on the island of Daru in Papua New Guinea. And this has raised concerns in Australia's security community about China's exploitation of fishing resources. Uh, how and why such a fishing park might constitute a security threat to Australia, I think needs much more attention. And since 1974, traditional Indonesian vessels have been allowed uh, access in an area known as the MOU box, which is northwest of Broome. In and in this area, Australia agrees not to enforce its fish, uh, fisheries laws. But through a failure to comply with some of those agreed rules, IUU fishing is occurring within that particular area uh, and have posed a threat to the marine environment. So the third point I'd like to make is the Northern Seas also reveals a relationship between maritime security and climate change. And this is something that Anthony mentioned in, in the Pacific. And, and it's the same in, in the Torres Strait. This is one of Australia's most climate vulnerable areas. And we tend to hear a lot about rising sea level and, and its impact on Pacific islands, but it's also having an impact on Australia. Uh, sea level rise is predicted to double the global average uh, in the Torres Strait. Islander communities are the ones that will bear the high cost from Australia's failure to address climate change. Uh, and these are issues that are happening now. There are low-lying islands very close to Papua New Guinea, uh, Australian islands that are exposed to extreme periodic flooding, erosion and coastal inundation as the powerful king tides become even more uh, destructive. So climate change is an existential security threat, not just to you know, uh, communities in the Pacific or Southeast Asia, but also in Australia. And finally, Australia's regional relationships matter, politics matter. What David was saying about smaller states having agency is absolutely crucial. Australia was right to sign a maritime boundary treaty with Timor-Leste in the Timor Sea, but there are ongoing concerns that the loss of goodwill uh, between Timor during uh, the, the, the tension, the tense two decades around maritime boundary negotiation might actually have a consequence in the future particularly as we exist in this world of strategic competi competition and it's unclear what China's intention in Timor-Leste may be, particularly as successive Timorese governments continue to search for infrastructure for its Tasimane refining hub on the south coast, which would have strategic implications for Australia uh, if China were to become involved in that infrastructure. So we do need to be engaging with these states in a positive way, uh, not just through defence, but through diplomacy and development as well. Uh, I, I will leave it there, but I just wanted to wrap it up by saying that there's no clear divide. Uh, the Northern Seas, I hope 
I've given you this picture just through that snapshot. There's no clear divide between conventional and non-conventional maritime security challenges, such as pandemics, climate change, sustainability and transnational blue crime. They're integrated, they're complex, they're inherently political, and they require holistic long-term whole of government responses. I'm now going to put my Liz Buchanan face on. <laughs> Liz uh, was tasked with uh, talking about the Southern Ocean, and Liz would like to make four points here today via myself. Uh, the first is that Australia overlooks its southern flank, Antarctica, in somewhat uh, of an impressive manner. She says that the entire continent is regularly missing from defence and foreign policy global maps, and the region is often relegated to a pop-out table or box in our white papers. Why is this the case? We have normalised national strategic complacency via, a nation, uh, via the notion of if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Australian policymakers haven't done enough to cultivate a national sense of agency in any debate over Australia's Antarctic interests. The second point. Our strategic conception of Antarctica Southern Ocean is at odds with our Indo-Pacific mates. This matters. We lack a common geographical definition of the Indo-Pacific to speak to, particularly on boundaries and definitions. For instance, US Indo-PACOM specifically includes Antarctica and Southern Ocean in its Indo-Pacific vision and area of operation. Australia's Defence Strategic Update of 2020 narrowed the Indo-Pacific framing to Northeast Asian approaches. Capability-wise, it is a similar story. The US Coast Guard is reinvesting in the Polar Security Cutter Program and plans to station one vessel permanently in the Southern Ocean region, perhaps Hobart. Navy has no ice-hardened vessels. It needs the French to assist in patrolling one of the world's largest SAR zones in the Southern Ocean. It has a single Rolls Royce of icebreakers currently in dry dock Singapore for scheduled repairs, and it rents support vessels where required. Third, we've drunk our own cooperation cool aid in terms of East-West cooperation and the treaty's Cold War success. So the mere continued functioning of the, uh, the Antarctic Treaty System, the ATS, is not an efficient way to measure Antarctic geopolitical health. This is not to say that the ATS is failing. Indeed, states have an interest in upholding the system as it is, but this is a problem because the ATS facilitates strategic competition as it always has since its birth during the Cold War. Upholding the ATS continues to be in Australia's national interest. It returns a great return. Uh, it delivers a great return on investment, a whooping huge 42% claim that Australia has shelved into perpetuity uh, in terms of its, claim, its territorial claim uh, in Antarctica. We need to recognise and grasp the coercive elements of Antarctic cooperation and the entrenched nature of grey zone activities on the continent, including through dual use technology that can be applied in both scientific and military contexts. Russian fishing vessels spoofing their locations to signal that they're not in protected Antarctic waters. And one could also argue that marine protected areas are an extension of some claimants' territorial ambitions as well. And this is a charge that has been levelled at Australia. Overall, subversion, deception and sophisticated interpretations of international legal norms in Antarctica are becoming the hallmark of the ATS. The fourth point. What can or should we, as proponents of the existing liberal rules-based order, do when it comes to Antarctica? The window to build credible enforcement mechanisms into the ATS is gone. A consensus um, in which Putin's Russia and Xi Jinping's China exist um, in consensus with other claimants is now incompatible. So we raise the stakes. Where are the areas of mutual interest in Antarctica? Climate research and science. Antarctica is the sole and longest running global data set we have for weather patterns. 
autocracies and democracies alike recognise this value. So turbocharge investment and support international linkages via the currency of science and diplomacy via strategic science. Next, we can show up and show up credibly. Presence is influence and influence is power in the Antarctic context. Traditionally, we have relied on a handful of Antarctic gateway states as gatekeepers for flights in and out of ports uh, in and out of Antarctica. Times have changed. The biggest strategic mistake Australia has made on the southern flank will prove to be the nixing of a year-round ice-free paved runway in East Antarctica. There is nothing stopping the Chinese or the Russians from building on that proposed site. Uh, and the, the costing the proposal has given a green light to other states in any case with regards to uh, permissibility of the venture. Australia could have cost shared with China, Russia or India to deliver the infrastructure needed to resupply bases, to ensure rapid health of expeditioners and to stop climate scientists having to use weeks at sea to access time, uh, to access data, but we don't have the time. Like-minded states are already and still building runway infrastructure on Antarctica. Italy has just finished its new gravel runway pitched to reduce resilience on the US runway system. And there are private tourist firms are building a litany of runways and injecting tourist numbers like never before, which brings new security challenges to a pristine environment. It would appear given recent Pacific developments and the trajectory of Beijing overall, that we at least need to consider seriously a national Antarctic policy which pays equal attention to the ATS and also to the AAT. And we need to revise our assumptions that led to the 2016 Defence White Paper idea that the AAT faces no credible risk of being challenged in such a way that requires a substantial military response for at least the next few decades. Where's our capability? Are we skilled and ready? What's the threat? Is it even in breach of ATS norms? What does the challenge look like? Will we see it when it comes? Has Washington acknowledged the AAT, the Australian Antarctic Territory claim? Thank you. Thank you very much, not only for proposing some uh, alternate lenses for us to view the northern uh, waters, but also uh, for channelling uh, Liz and doing a fabulous job of highlighting some of the challenges down south there, and she's clearly made those quite concise points, which is great. Um, thank you to all the speakers here. As we've seen, we have a, uh, a very uh, diverse um, boundaries in Australia with our four oceans, all of them uh, representing opportunities and challenges and quite different uh, depending on where they are. So we're now going to run through some questions. We've got the first ones coming, but please uh, continue to push those through on the app. The first question uh, is for Admiral Molina. Uh, accepting that Australia and Chile are firm friends, like-minded and very similar in many respects, even producing fine wine, how will the two nations nourish a practical cooperation and what should we focus on now and what are the longer term goals? Well, having in mind that we share the same hemisphere and we are two uh, maritime nations which depend on the, on, on the sea to survive, I think that we should uh, continue working together in, uh, in, a, in a cooperative alliances to protect the, the trade which uh, is, is circulating or is in sailing in this part of the world. Um, please have in mind there are 200 companies which have investment in Chile, and those products have to move from Chile to Asia mainly. And the protection of those uh, interests belongs to Chile and Australia as well. And that's why I think that we should enhance the cooperation in alliance with, with Australia, even, even though that we are so far apart. But our intention is to be work, continuous working together, under, mutual understanding and participating in as much as we can, having in mind that we are so far apart. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question um, I'm going to throw to uh, Dr. Bergen. Uh, 
What strategic challenges loom as climate change and great power competition makes exploitation of the Antarctic more conceivable and how might Australia respond to these challenges? <clears throat> okay, that's to me, all right. <laughs> um, well, there's no doubt that um, climate change could have an impact in terms of the possible development of Antarctic resources because more with climate change, more of the continent will be exposed. Um, so there's, it does open up the possibility, I guess, of, of, of climate change, um, uh, greater exploitation opportunities in Antarctica. Um, in terms of um, uh, how might Australia respond, um, well, there is a there is a um, a ban on Antarctic mineral exploration and exploitation till 2048, where it, that prohibition under the Madrid Protocol can come up for review. It's a very complicated process to get the, to overturn that ban, but it's, it's a possibility. So the question is asking what can Australia do in the context of uh, the possibility of Antarctic resource exploitation is to invest, I think, in greater diplomatic effort around <clears throat> preserving the Antarctic Treaty. I note um, uh, Liz Buchanan's comments um, that we just heard from Beck being sceptical <coughs> um, about the uh, durability of the Antarctic Treaty. It's operated for 60 years. Look, put me down as a sort of cautious optimist. I mean, I think um, Liz Buchanan is right that um, there will be greater, greater stresses and strains on the Antarctic Treaty. And by the way, next week in Berlin, the Antarctic Treaty countries meet um, and Guess what? Is Russia going to participate? Uh, Russia's a major player. It's got five uh, Antarctic stations. It's a major player in Antarctica. Um, I, the Germans are taking a uh, hard line on, on Ukraine. Um, I suspect what will happen uh, next week in Berlin is that the Russians uh, uh, who are based in Russia, uh, sorry, the Russians that are based in, in Germany would be allowed to attend. I, I don't know whether the, the Germans will allow, um, you know, Russians to, to, to attend the Antarctic meeting. By the way, as a sidebar, when the Soviet Union collapsed, there was a dramatic impact on the Russians in Antarctica. They were stranded. They didn't have any supplies and so forth. And other countries had to provide rescue <laughs> for, the, for the Russian uh, Antarctic scientists. Now, given the impact, the long-term impacts of the Ukraine war are going to have on Russia, maybe Australia is going to have to start thinking about some humanitarian response for the Russian scientists in Antarctica. I just throw that out as something that we need to, to think about. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question to Dr Brewster. Australia will operate nuclear-powered submarines. With this new capability will come new obligations in the region. What do you see as these obligations and how will Australia meet them? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I suppose in pure capability terms, uh, nuclear-powered submarines will make it uh, considerably easier for the Australian Navy to project power right across its area of interest from Persian Gulf, East Africa, up to the Korean Peninsula and uh, across to the South Pacific, a huge, which is a huge part of the Earth's surface. And I should also add another key aspect of the AUKUS deal is uh, the likely basing of US and UK nuclear submarines in Australia, or at least long-term visits to Australian uh, uh, facilities. I think all of these developments make it even more important that we prioritise <coughs> our, um, our, our resources and our, our, our interests so we don't get, uh, uh, we don't see too much mission creep, we don't try and uh, deal with every issue 
uh, across a vastly extended area uh, of the, of the Indo-Pacific. So I know that there has been a lot of um, uh, uh, prioritisation being done in the last five years or so, and we need to, I think, double down on what is the most important issues that we need to and can deal with and what we need to leave to others. I mentioned, in terms of working with other countries, um, I mentioned in my presentation that I see Australia having to step outside of its comfort zone somewhat in coming years in terms of building and joining in new coalitions with other middle powers, including um, with countries that we traditionally haven't worked with. And I see uh, a real um, uh, um, uh, uh, key um, area that Australia has skills in is in leading coalitions. Um, we have worked, Australian Defence Force has worked for so many decades with other powers right around the world and including uh, the combined military forces in the Gulf, for example, which we've led uh, on several occasions. And I think that's a key skill set that Australia can offer to the region in helping to put together coalitions of military forces which will include um, uh, non-traditional partners. Thank you. And Dr Bergen, what are the implications of the security agreements between China and the Solomon Islands and how must Australia respond? Well, I made some remarks in my talk about um, the impact that I saw in terms of um, a possible facility complicating Australian submarine operations, particularly near the Taiwan theatre of operations. But let me address that question a different way. Last week we saw leaked to the Australian newspaper another draft agreement on the blue economy between China and the Solomon Islands. It listed a whole range of uh, Chinese activities that they wanted to conclude with the Solomons, including undersea cables, um, sea farming, uh, fisheries, um, ports, uh, etc. So the reason why I was alarmed at that was because if you read this blue economy um, uh, agreement alongside the security agreement, the most insidious clause, I believe, in that security agreement that China's done with the Solomons, the most insidious is this provision that allows China to deploy its forces to protect its economic uh, interests in, in, in the Solomons, okay? I mean, it's unheard of. It would be like a country saying, well, I've got uh, a mine in northwest Australia and, you know, if, if, there's, if, if there's rioting or protests, I, I can send my, my, our forces in to protect it. Um, so the reason I became alarmed at this blue economy um, agreement is because it's going to open up a whole panoply of new facilities and, uh, that will allow the Chinese um, to, as it were, create a red flag, uh, you know, false flag to go in and protect their interests. What should Australia do? My goodness, um, <laughs> it's, it's a whole seminar. I'll tell you one thing we shouldn't do. We shouldn't be putting all our eggs in, in the Sogavari basket. Why don't we start talking to the Premier of, uh, of Malaita, the Premier of Western Province? Why don't we start talking to the chiefs, church leaders, women's groups? We should be talking to the people in the Solomons that are opposed to this uh, agreement, the, the Solomon Sogavari. So what should we do? We should be reaching out uh, and talking not just to Sogavari and his people, but those in particular, people like uh, Daniel Sidani, the, the, the magnificent leader of Malaita, uh, who's been dogged in his opposition uh, to, to, to China. So, you know, I mean, I think on the diplomatic side, that's what we should be doing. We should be talking to those people, deepening our engagement with those people in the Solomons who are opposed to this agreement that the Solomons have concluded with China. 
Thank you. And I might just extend the opportunity for Dr Stratton to add any commentary to that, noting you did mention that we have uh, interest with uh, Papua New Guinea and China moving into that space. Have you had anything else you'd like to add in terms of those sort of pressures, not just for the Solomon, but those other countries to the north of us? Yeah, I, I agree uh, with what Anthony was just saying about the need for Australia to engage uh, beyond uh, particular governments, but to move more into uh, civil society spaces as well uh, in, uh, in the Pacific, but also in Southeast Asia. But uh, the comment that I would like to make is that uh, some of, the, some of the, the commentary in the Australian uh, media and some of the comments that uh, particular members uh, in the NATSEC or the national security community can make in Australia might be interpreted in some of these smaller islands as Australia trying to tell them what to do. And we need to be very careful with our strategic messaging. We need to recognise uh, that these states are sovereign. Uh, they have their own sovereign interests. They often don't share the same sorts of perception of threat as what Australia does. Australia sees uh, the rise of China as being you know, the core security challenge of our time. Uh, but a lot of leaders in the Pacific uh, and, and in other states see climate change as the existential security threat. And there is a misalignment in our perception of what matters. And so uh, uh, Australia's lack of action on climate change has strategic implications in how we relate with our neighbours. And so we need to be very conscious that we um, moderate our language, uh, our public diplomacy in a way that it doesn't look like we are trying to impose our will on sovereign nations because of course sovereignty is a fundamental principle uh, underpinning uh, our concept of the Indo-Pacific. You don't let your best mate drink and drive, Beck. And um, it's Australia being uh, telling, uh, you know, relaying our concerns to the Solomons that it's not just a decision for the Solomons, it impacts across the whole region, this agreement. So, Absolutely. you know, as I say, you don't let your best mate drink and drive. Well, I mean, the problem is with how the comments are perceived by strategic elites in different countries. That's the point that I would make. Um, and taking Anthony's point, as I said, I agree with, absolutely with the idea of engaging uh, with a broader range of people uh, and groups uh, within uh, smaller island countries, but they have their agency and that needs to at least be acknowledged. Fantastic. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please join me in thanking the, the distinguished panel. Um, it's quite obvious from the last few comments that the debate is still live, which is fantastic. Uh, I think that uh, they've provided some really interesting lenses on, on the various challenges that we have in Australia and opportunities going forward. And uh, I know that I've gone away with, which is always the best way to do, more questions than answers. Um, and I really appreciate for, from everyone for putting those there. Uh, but thank you very much.